Breaking news, this is your World War III update and this is going to be an extensive video because there is so much happening today from robots to nuclear submarines to troops being moved into Ukraine. Let's just get right to it and I assure you, you're going to hear some unique analysis you ain't going to get anywhere else. France is sending in 2,000 troops into Ukraine. Okay, this is according to the head of the Foreign Intelligence service in Russia, Sergei Narishkin. Now, the question is why? Why is France suddenly putting troops in the ground? Why can't they just continue to send mercenaries and special forces and plainclothes troops and trainers and things of that nature? Well, the fact is, according to the Russians now, they claim that the French can no longer fudge the numbers. They can no longer conceal the amount of people who are actually dying there with family members back home in France, okay? Now, here's what's going on, and people really need to understand what's happening here, because this bears repeating. Right now, NATO is in a hot war with Russia, but neither side wants to admit it, because as soon as they admit it, that requires the administration and the enforcement of red lines. Because of course, you can't allow a boundary to be overstepped because it makes you look weak in the minds of your constituents. So Russia also has a vested interest in suppressing NATO's involvement in this conflict because they don't want it to go parabolic and nuclear. They know that right when NATO troops in full uh, battle dress uniforms are facing off with the Russian troops right across the Dnieper River, whatever they're planning here, they know that the stakes are going to be so high at that point that there are much fewer steps in between a nuclear escalatory incident than there are right now. So they keep it on the low low. But make no mistake, NATO is currently actively fighting a war with the Russians. Both sides suppress it. Now here's the strategy with NATO right now. They know that it is incredibly unpopular right now across Europe, especially in the United States, to br never mind bringing troops in, just getting you know funding and resources for the conflict is hard to come by at this point in time. Putting troops in, forget about it. Unless you can provoke the Russians into attacking you. How you do this? You surreptitiously move equipment and troops into the battle zone, and you continue to do things like attack nuclear power plants like the Ukrainians did today, uh, embolden and uh, enable partisan groups, paramilitia groups on the borders between Ukraine and Russia to actually invade Russia. What they're trying to do right now is very quietly push Russia into attacking NATO because you need to take that 10% approval rating when it comes to should we put troops on the ground in Ukraine. I'm talking, of course, about primarily the European Union countries because I think we're far away from that in the US, maybe not so much uh, Canada, but yeah, at this point in time, it's a slippery slope. Things can happen very fast, but you need to bring that 10% in the very least up to a 50% support for going to war, sending troops into Ukraine. And the only way you do that is with some kind of flash bulb event. I'm not talking about a false flag. I'm saying that right now we are antagonizing the Russians into doing something against us. But this also is working both ways, okay? NATO doesn't want to trigger Article 5 either because nobody really wants nuclear war. Uh, maybe some people realize that they have islands down in uh, the southern hemisphere and they have a getaway plan. But at the end of the day, these are rapacious people. They want to continue to make money and uh, get as much money off the backs of all the wage slaves as they can while the getting is good. So they want to kick that can down the road just a little bit. So NATO doesn't want to invoke Article 5. Russia also doesn't want to impose any nuclear red lines either. But they will... And what they want to avoid is what's about to happen with the 2,000 French troops. France can no longer conceal the numbers. That's according to Russian intelligence. Let's do a rapid fire of the headlines today. Britain is saying that it's also ready to send troops according to Ben Wallace. So now you pretty much have every single country in NATO, with the exception of the Americans, and I think Biden had a Freudian slip a year and a half ago where he said, you know, you're going to be fighting in Ukraine someday. That wasn't, you know, just a, a speaking error. He was basically telegraphing maybe what the plan was a couple years down the road. 
We have Poland and Germany getting ready to uh, deploy rapid response forces at a moment's notice into Ukraine. Approximately 5,000 troops will be at the ready, again, all under the guise of Steadfast Defender. Poland is training guys to fly F-35s, and get this, those F-35s, they're training, they're training to... Uh, get, to fly the F-35s as deployed with nuclear weapons. So why is Poland, a non-nuclear sharing partner with the United States, training to uh, use nuclear weapons with these F-35s? Okay, this is why anytime you enter into the F-35 program, you are automatically considered a nuclear target by the Russians. Ukraine attacking a nuclear plant in the Kursk region in Russia led to power outages. Power apparently has been restored in that region. British nuclear submarine set a new record for days on deployment. 201 days on deployment. If that's not a testament to how stretched thin and how high the DEFCON level is, I don't know what is. Because remember, they just broke the same record last year with 195 day deployment. Okay, man, time is flying. Russia apparently may have had uh, some involvement in the downing or the uh, going off radar of a Reaper drone, possibly utilizing electronic warfare, GPS jamming, maybe they even hacked it. Again, there is a secret silent war going on between the Russians and NATO, and this drone that they lost communication with in Poland is likely another instance of that very thing. There's rapid decoupling happening between East and West that we're not even hearing about anymore. For example, Microsoft is leaving Russia. Many other big tech firms are likely going to follow in suit. CERN, you know, the large Hadron Collider guys, uh, they're kicking out 500 Russian scientists by November. Do they not want them to get a hold of those nuclear secrets or whatever sort of super weapon they're going to create using the Large Hadron Collider. In the future, it's very likely. No more gas is going to be transited through Ukraine. New tariffs are likely to increase the cost of grain from Belarus and Russia by 50% for Europe. Armenia is no longer accepting Russian bank cards and they may well join NATO because the leader of Armenia met with Jan Stoltenberg the other day. So it's possible that Armenia will be the 33rd member of NATO. Lithuania and Germany aren't even recognizing Vladimir Putin as the leader of the country. How do you engage in diplomacy if you're not recognizing the guy with an 87% approval rating or 87% uh, of the vote, I should say, as the leader of the country? And one thing people need to understand about high approval ratings is that the greater the approval rating and the higher the amount of votes you get, it actually paradoxically creates a situation where you almost beget a armed resistance. If there's gonna be any resistance, it's going to be armed resistance. In a democracy where it's a dead heat right to the finish, as it always is, you know, left, right, two wings of the same bird, we all know that, Hegelian dialectic. But in a, so that you don't need an armed revolution because 50% of the people are just gonna disagree. But remember, all it takes is something like 3% of a uh, uh, population who is uh, very uh, cohesive and has a, a very strong ideological sense and is very well organized to overthrow the government. So the greater the majority, the less likely the minority has of ever having a voice. Therefore, their only means of actually having their voice heard is through militant means. So you have a greater likelihood that those people are going to turn coat possibly become spies, uh, saboteurs. So this is what Putin is up against. Even if you, you grant him that he has such a high approval rating and that it wasn't a sham election and that it's all legit, you have to also understand that those people who you know didn't vote for him or voted for somebody else, there's probably a lot of those people who have very strong views in the other direction, okay? And uh, that means that there's a great, greater likelihood of militant uh, upheaval and a possible coup. And Putin knows this. All uh, strongman leaders are aware of this fact. Russia is currently evacuating 9,000 children from Belgorod. I never really understood how you could evacuate just the children unless they just include the parents in the children. I'm not really sure you know, how these things are publicized 
in Russia, when they say that they're, uh, you know, evacuating 9,000 children, do they mean that that's the parents as well? Or do the parents stay there in order to work and uh, be human shields for the coming onslaught? I don't really understand that, but that's a sign, okay, that if they're, if they're removing these kids from Belgorod, the things aren't going so well there. Now, there was rumor recently, going way off topic here, there was rumor recently, and I did report on this a few days ago, that there is a, uh, there is a nuclear weapons facility, a former nuclear weapons storage facility near Belgorod, which was likely emptied out years ago. Regardless, uh, this story was making the rounds on the internet. I didn't put too much stock into it. But the Russians did say they knew two weeks in advance that there was going to be an attack in that region. Now, my question is, if you knew that there was going to be an attack in the Belgorod region, if you know what I'm talking about, let's see if we can find it on the map here. If you knew there was going to be an attack, why wouldn't you put a, a brigade or two of troops in there to prevent this from happening? Okay, so here's Belgorod. Uh, and it's right here. And then this is, oh shit, I'm, my big ass head's in the way. So here's Belgorod, and then here's the border with Ukraine. So they're coming on here, and they're shelling over the border. So why wouldn't you, you know, knowing that this was going to happen, why wouldn't you put some troops there, right? Why would you wait? And uh, so I'm thinking that the Russians, this is a classic lie hop scenario. Let it happen on purpose. Because of course, if you have that neo-Nazi, uh, outspoken paramilitary neo-Nazi groups, and this is not, you know, this is all on Wikipedia, so, you know, I, I shouldn't have to continuously say that. It's very weird that we can't even say the word, if you really think about it, considering everything that's going on, and now you got the French with these military commercials supporting the Azov Battalion, and, and things are getting weird, okay? Anyways, uh, why is it that they didn't put troops there in advance? It's almost as if they want to be attacked on that front. Again, you know, one of the greatest ways to, uh, to it, it, just imagine a castle uh, analogy, okay? If you guys have guys beating on the gates, right? If you have raiders at the gates, you can scare all the peasants into maybe giving up more of their liberties uh, in order for you to keep them safe. And I think this is what's happening. So a lot of the Russophiles are not gonna agree with this, but I think the Russians are actually allowing this to happen. And of course, this is why Vladimir Putin's popularity shot up once again, because anytime the Russians are getting attacked, anytime they're entangled in a high intensity conflict, Putin's popularity goes up and he gets a greater percentage of the votes. Every year he's been voted in, he's had a much higher percentage of the vote. So I think that's what's happening. I think this whole nuclear empty weapons facility they claim that the Ukrainians were trying to get nuclear weapons from this facility, but there's a lot of uh, question marks there. Like, what would you do if you had if you had actually got them? I don't think the Russians would ever have allowed that in the first place, or that the Russians knew that they were going to do this, so the Russians kind of turned a blind eye, luring them in. Uh, but how would they use the nukes? Because you can't just you know use a nuke. There's codes, there's all sorts of uh, fail-safe stock gaps to make sure that they can't just be used by anybody. So, you know, I'm calling BS on that one. But there was a known nuclear weapon storage facility in that actual area a long time ago. But I'm quite certain that that has been vacated. But what I don't understand and what a lot of the Russophiles are downplaying is the fact that this is happening at all. I mean, this should not be happening at all if you're doing victory laps in and around Ad Advivka and uh, you're claiming that the Ukrainians are on the back foot, yet they're still, you got these rogue, ragtag paramilitary groups coming across the border. That doesn't make sense, guys, okay? Anyways, moving on. The U.S. Uh, claims to have successfully uh, tested a hypersonic missile, but I just got a message from Castle Bravo who says, no, it's bullshit. It was not a successful test. So we're just going to leave it at that. That guy knows his stuff. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go and check out the interview. I'll post a link in the description. We also have to talk about Israel equipping underground parking lots with supplies. Yesterday, I talked about how there was a run on generators and all types of supplies as Israel is preparing to be completely disconnected 
from their ports, from their airports, and quite possibly going into a blackout scenario when the war with Hezbollah begins, okay? We have some uh, optimistic news of strategic arms control. Surprisingly, the United States is extending an olive branch to Russia and China, but I think that the, the Russian and the Chinese at this point in time, they're gonna chalk it up to be just another deception. Just more uh, beguiling deceit from the US empire. <clears throat> what they're saying is they want to have nuclear talks unconditionally, okay? And this is from, I can't remember what her name is, but it's someone in the UN Security Council representing the United States government. They're claiming that they want to have unconditional strategic arms reduction talks to get New START three on the table and to bring China on board. Unfortunately, as I expressed yesterday, there currently is a space-based warfare uh, that is currently underway, an arms race that we're not hearing about, just like we're not hearing about the war, the hot war between Russia and NATO at this point in time. And uh, that's because that's very scary, okay? You have Elon Musk getting ready to put up constant surveillance satellite technology, Starlink, whatever else. Uh, the Starship program is a cover for, of course, you have the secret programs with the United States government. Russia wants to put a nuclear space station into space, which is essentially the same thing as putting a nuclear weapon into space, which means the United States is going to do it. So we're entering a whole new era of uh, space-based nuclear arms race. And I don't think any sort of uh, conversations at this point in time, especially when you have US special forces right on China's border, I don't think that talk is gonna go too far, but let's hope it does. Speaking of which, China is currently stepping up their patrols near Kinmen Island, okay? And Kinmen Island is right off the coast of China, okay? And uh, this is where you have US Special Forces stationed, if you can believe that. That's the equivalent of having the Chinese military special forces on Vancouver Island. That's how close we are to China's mainland. So you think that they would be pissed off? Estonia, the leader, Kaja Kalas, Kalas, is saying that we shouldn't be afraid of nuclear war. And that could have something to do, and this is why we should send troops. Don't be afraid of nuclear war. It's all rhetoric. Send troops. It's, everything's going to be fine. And this could be because she actually has a warrant out for her arrest by the Russian government, which means that Russia will most definitely eventually try to invade the Baltic states, okay? You don't do that for no reason. The jurisprudence of the Russian government is uh, something that they pride themselves on, so they're not just making this stuff up, okay? Ukraine is also fortifying Odessa, likely in an attempt to interdict any sort of Russian intervention into Transnistria. Of course, if Russia wants to get to Transnistria, they gotta go through Odessa. We've seen an attack in Transnistria just the other day, meaning that the situation is ramping up there as well. Now, in terms of this French deployment of troops, okay, so this is a report on French television. On the same day that Sergei Narishkin, the head of the Foreign Intelligence Service in Russia, is saying that, yeah, France is going to put troops into Ukraine. So all of this rhetoric, it all has legs, guys. It's just a matter of uh, stalling tactics on both sides because they know the French can't conceal the numbers anymore and the Russians don't want to admit they're in a hot war with NATO because that means they have to really start the nuclear brinkmanship. So what they're basically saying in this report, the short of it is that this is the Dnieper River and this is how it's going to look. I mean, this is eventually this is how it's going to look. You're going to have the Russians probably in control of this side of the Dnieper River, even though they have a long way to go, considering they can't beat like a, a few battalions of uh, paramilitary, unorganized guys here who are obviously being enabled by Kiev, who's being enabled by NATO. So yes, NATO is currently attacking Russian nuclear power plants. Let's make that abundantly clear. There's no other way to sugarcoat it. That is exactly what's happening. What's gonna happen is the only real tenable situation here is that Russia takes this side of the river and Kiev is some you know borderland region or they have this buffer zone. I think uh, Putin is calling it the sanitation zone. Okay, so probably up to about here, you could just say, you know, just ballpark, you're, you're gonna have Russian troops. <clears throat> that means they're gonna have to take Kharkov. <clears throat> what they're probably gonna do, excuse me, is trying to do some sort of cauldron situation because you don't wanna go into a hot war 
inside of Kharkov. It's a city of like 1.5 million people. I'm not sure how many people are still there. I'm sure half the fighting age males are now infirm as they've been sent to the front lines against their will. Uh, but you, you don't want to fight a battle there because that would just be bloody. That would be like Bakhmut times 50, okay? So what they're probably going to do is they're probably going to try to encircle it and cut it off from resupply and then just try to, <clears throat> you know, win it over politically, possibly, and annex the territory in <clears throat> that sort of way. And then, of course, you're going to have French troops, according to these guys now, this is French television. Is the French media just testing the waters to see what people are going to think, to see how they're going to respond to all of this? It's quite possible. Uh, but they're saying that they're going to go all the way up to the Dnieper River and that they're not going to actually participate in the fighting. And, of course, in Belarus, okay, because they're worried about Belarus coming across. Of course, we're the, the, the bad guys are the red, right? The good guys are the blue. Blue pill, red pill. Hmm, I'm seeing some uh, metaphors there. Anyways, so uh, this means that it, it's not gonna it's not gonna matter. Okay, so it, it, as, as soon as you have troops inside Ukraine, Russia is going to have to presume that they are a part of the war machine that is being waged against them. So obviously they're going to be targets. It doesn't matter if you have troops way in the rear and they're helping with logistics, or you have troops closer to the front. Uh, shuttling up, you know, artillery shells to the artillery. Uh, it doesn't really matter. It's all the same. It, it's all equal. So this means is that the, the stakes at this point in time, when this finally does materialize, if it hasn't already, again, there are already mercenaries, plain clothes, special forces, okay, already actively taking part in the conflict. So they're already in a hot war. Really, this is just public disclosure, a lot of this. That's what I think this is. This is for public consumption, getting us all ready for the next stage of escalation. Again, what NATO wants to do is very quietly provoke the Russians into attacking us because that's the only way they are going to get support for what is about to happen. There has to be an attack on NATO soil you have to put the fear into people. If people are not afraid, there's no way in hell they're going to commit uh, to a war with Russia. But they're already starting to prime the population, subconsciously getting people ready to accept the fact that they're going to bring back conscription. They're talking about war economies and slowly increasing the production of weapon systems, slowly increasing the GDP, uh, the proportion of GDP allocated to military expenditures. They're slowly getting us ready for this. And eventually, all they're going to need now is once everything is in place, Steadfast Defender is basically providing the, the getting uh, the infrastructure laid out so that they can eventually do mass mobilization. You're not going to fight the Russians with the 100,000 NATO troops or the 300,000 combat readiness force. That is just to get the stage all set, okay? And then, once they get the flashbulb event they need, bam, they can activate it all. And they can do this campaign that I guarantee you, they already have the commercials made, they already have the graphics artists on the payroll, they have the songs that they're going to use, they know exactly how they're going to sell it to the population. Mark my words, this is what's going to happen next. We told you guys months ago, when nobody else was saying that they were going to put troops in Ukraine, we were the first channel to break this news. Not that I was the first uh, person to have this information, but it was a Russian source that provided us with this information. And here we are three months later. What a surprise. And indeed, we have contacts in high levels that are also echoing uh, this concern that indeed they're hearing that this is what's going to happen. My contacts in the industry are saying that the military is stocking up and, you know, you should probably too. Uh, just FYI, we're having a bit of a sale. So if you want to get, uh, we got to get rid of last year's seed stock. So these are limitless growth, uh, 10 vegetables, 3,000 seeds. This will last years, possibly decades if you keep it in a cool, dark place. This is going to be worth more than gold. 
get your survival seed vault. In the very least, I don't even care if you're not a gardener. There's a reason why Norway has the Svalbard seed vault and why they're storing it far away from where anybody can get it. Unfortunately, a nuclear weapon can get it. And many countries around the world, Russia and China included, have their own equivalent seed vaults. So it's a very small investment. I think these are something like 17 bucks. But uh, we're going to give you one free of charge if you place an order over 100 bucks. Okay, so at CanadianPreparedness.com, get your food, whatever you need, or just get the survival seeds that we have there. Okay, so we have a lot available. That is probably one of the most cost effective things that you can do if you're on a budget. You should obviously be growing your own food this day and age. I mean, the price of food is just, we're really in a transitional period like we were in the 80s when a chocolate bar went from like 10 cents to 75 cents seemingly overnight. This is where we're at right now. We're in that transition phase. Hopefully it stops somewhere, but I'm not convinced it's going to stop anytime soon because of course the decoupling is currently underway. Poland is training to carry nuclear weapons. This is from my source inside Poland. In a TV interview last night, retired General Raymond Anshaychuk, who up to four months ago was the chief of the general staff of the Polish Armed Forces, stated that Polish pilots training in the U.S. on F-35s are also practicing to have nuclear payloads on those planes. Polish pilots are training on F-35s with nuclear payloads. That's all you need to know. The chief of the Presidential National Security Bureau, a name I'm not going to try to pronounce because uh, we have already 26 minutes in here, has publicly denied that any of the 96 Apache helicopters that are being brought to Poland are going to be used inside Ukraine, meaning they're going to be used inside Ukraine. More information on the Reaper drone that was brought down. I think this was just another case of either electronic warfare. There was a drone that went down in Poland, if you don't know. It was probably either electronic warfare, maybe they hacked it. Um, maybe it was just incompetence on the part of NATO. There's a lot of stuff going on there right now. The more military activity you have, the more accidents occur. Uh, apparently, it was disconnected from... Uh, the mothership and it went off radar they couldn't uh, communicate with the device and it came back on and they were uh, finally able to land it was it gps jamming was it ew was it a uh, hack job who knows either way shit's getting real polish supreme auditing chamber the polish equivalent to the u.s government accountability office has just issued a report on the state of shelters and bunkers in poland which declares that only four percent of the population currently has a place to hide in a facility that conforms to technical standards for such use. So Poland is committing to a nationwide bunker building campaign. Former, former British Defense Secretary, we should not rule out sending our soldiers into Ukraine. Actually, let's uh, go to the screen uh, for the rest of today's video. We do have a lot of notes to go over, but um, there's a lot of stuff I want to show you guys today. So France's army chief, the guy with the funny looking hat, is also saying that the French army is ready. Okay. Uh, this is our information coming from, this is the only place that we're getting this from, but uh, this is just a decoded uh, tweet, uh, translated tweet. Basically, the Ukrainian armed forces attempted to attack the Kurchatov nuclear power plant in the Kerch region with at least five kamikaze drones and one S-200 missile. Now, they were successful in taking out either some uh, transmission lines or possibly transformers that were connected to this nuclear power facility, but they did not successfully target the nuclear power plant. Again, the Russians are downplaying this for some reason, the same reason that they've downplayed attacks on their nuclear triad, on their nuclear bombers, on nuclear power plants, places where they manufacture nuclear weapons. The same reason why they continuously downplay this because they know that NATO is trying to goad them into a hot war. NATO needs some sort of excuse to drum up public support for this war, and the Russians have yet to take the bait. The time is going to come, however, when the loss is going to be so severe and obvious that they're going to have no choice but to make a public show 
of their discontent. Former British uh, Defense Secretary is saying that we should not rule out sending our soldiers to Ukraine. So this is former Defense Minister Ben Wallace saying this. They're all saying the same thing. They're basically all saying that we already have troops there and uh, we're going to need some more now because we no longer can seal the fact that so many of them are dying. That's the gist of it. A Royal Navy nuclear armed submarine has smashed the record for the longest voyage after 201 days at sea. I don't know how that compares to their American counterparts. Is that, you know, like a world record or is that just a record for the UK? It is a testament to the fact that the DEFCON level is much higher than it used to be. The HMS Vengeance set sail on August 29th and didn't return until Sunday, six months and 18 days later. And of course, just one year prior to this, the record was set by another UK nuclear submarine for 195 days. And of course, we're seeing fires on these warships on these nuclear submarines in the UK, failures of their um, tests of their Trident missile systems, and just, you know, one thing after another, which shows you that they are stretched incredibly thin right now. They're about to evacuate 9,000 children from the Belgorod region. So this is from a Russian source. Again, I don't understand the logic of just evacuating the children without the parents? Is it to keep them there as human shields? Or is this just, you know, coded speak for we're evacuating the 9,000 families associated with those children, or maybe just the women and the children? I don't know. Either way, this is a sign that the Russians do not have this situation under control. But again, maybe that's what they want. CERN is about to end cooperation with 500 specialists associated with Russia. So they don't want the Russians close to whatever it is they're about to discover utilizing the Large Hadron Collider. This is the multipolar world that we are entering. Every time you sever connections like this, I mean, fortunately, there still is a relationship with the space station. The Russian astronauts are still sharing the same space with the American astronauts. And in fact, uh, there's been occasions throughout the war even that the Russians have uh, brought back American astronauts from space. So, you know, but when you, when you take, when you remove this, these relationships, it not only, it just increases the divide between the two sides, but it also increases the fog of war <clears throat> because then you don't know where your adversary is at, scientifically speaking, and the progress that they're making on these various technologies, whether it's in space, with CERN, with artificial intelligence, supercomputing, that sort of thing. Uh, this is just a map that is up to date and it came from Newsweek. And I think it's one of the, the more easily digestible ones that I've seen. Basically, it's showing you where all of the primary nuclear targets are going to be inside the United States. So the main targets are in red. And the blue targets are cities, urban centers. Again, I don't think that Russia or China, in fact, has a vested interest in targeting a lot of these cities, especially considering if they do, then the nuclear power plants are going to go down with them. They are primarily concerned with these red dots. Okay, yeah, Washington's going to go. There's no doubt about that. If there's ever going to be a nuke drop that's going to be on Washington, maybe Manhattan, uh, just for good measure. Naval Station, Norfolk, okay, we have uh, Barksdale Air Force Base. All of these are in some way, shape, or form associated with the nuclear triad, I presume. Uh, Pantex plant is going to be where they build nuclear weapons, I believe, or they assemble the components of the nuclear triad. Kirtland Air Force Base, Peterson Air Force Base in Denver, Colorado. So you know there's a lot of bunkers and stuff around here in the mountains as well. Whitman Air Force Base, Offutt. I believe that's home of uh, U.S. Strategic Command, Minot Air Force Base, lots of nuclear missile silos around here. And this is right underneath where I live, which is not a good thing. The jet stream is not what it used to be. Historically, uh, the winds would have blown all the radiation right up into the western provinces. And this was such a threat that they made a dedicated high production documentary of it back in the 80s. And which is rare for Canada because very low population here. But they made a documentary for it. I can't remember exactly what it's called. But after I 
I shared it the first time, I think it had about 70,000 views, now it has well over a million. So anyways, this is an interesting map on Newsweek, and of course some of the primary urban targets are San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Diego, Las Vegas, of course, Dallas, Houston, basically all the biggest cities, Miami, and New York, Philadelphia, and Chicago. So, looks like the Great Lakes are going to be contaminated after all. Putin's rhetoric is getting far more aggressive, okay? Uh, since he was re-elected, he's, you know, pulling no punches in terms of the uh, antagonistic language that he is using right now. So here he's talking about uh, basically traitors and NATO who are effectively fighting them in Ukraine. All attempts... Let me just read this for you guys. All attempts to break through to our territory by the sabotage in terrorist groups consisting of the enemy's regular forces, foreign mercenaries who are actively used as well, and any other kind of scum that ended up on the territory of the Kiev regime in different ways, all these attempts have failed. I want to turn your attention I'm just going to pause this and because I can read faster than he could talk, apparently. That when I was talking about these traitors, I asked, as it's always been in our history, not to forget who they are, uncover their identities. He's, of course, talking about the Neo-NAZIs. We will punish each and every one of them, regardless of the time that passes, no matter where they are. So he's saying that we are going to do extrajudicious killings in other countries, essentially, in regards to these traitors. Their masters don't feel sorry for them at all. They throw them like cannon fodder to die. And I would have to agree, there's some truth to that. We certainly don't uh, mind throwing bodies into the fire, especially if, the, if they're Eastern European ones. Poland and Germany are going to form an armored vehicle coalition. How are they doing this? Under the guise of Steadfast Defender. Up to 5,000 troops that are going to be ready at a moment's notice to deploy into Ukraine. This is uh, the lady, Kaja Kalas, who has a... Uh, a hit on her head from Vladimir Putin, she's basically trying to encourage people, other countries, other NATO countries, far from the fight, to commit troops into the fray so that uh, they don't get murked and they're not worried about nuclear war. She says, don't worry about nuclear war, it's all just rhetoric. Don't listen to what Vladimir Putin has to say. So, you have, okay, you are afraid of the nuclear war, so I'm I'm I mean, that's a, that's exactly what I say if I knew I was next on the chopping block. I'd say, yeah, just go for it. This is just a friendly reminder that we're still way up here. The market is still more overvalued than it was back in 1929. This is the Schiller P.E. ratio. I reference this every once in a while. And uh, this is the average, okay? This is the average. Now, people will say, Nate, this is oversimplified. If you're looking at the Schiller P.E. ratio, you have to look at just the last 30 years from 1990, and the average on the basis of that is actually around 25 or so. So we got it all wrong because, of course, that's when they started the money printers, right? But I would say I'm still a believer that everything regresses to the mean, and once this starts to drop, and look, we kind of had it start to drop there in, what was it, 2022-ish? Uh, 20, it was dropping, but, uh, you know, it got kicked up once again. So I do think that, you know, the economy is slowing immensely right now. It's only a matter of time before the economic contraction becomes realized in the markets. And whatever growth we're seeing in the markets is just inflation. It's just the inflation is currently hidden in the stock portfolios and in the Bitcoin bubble and in all these other bubbles uh, that are currently masking the true inflation, which is much, much worse. Because when that bubble deflates, all those people are going to take that money, that liquidity, and try to buy up hard assets. And when that happens, the price of things is going to skyrocket. So stagflation to hyperinflation, here we come. China is maintaining patrols near Taiwan-controlled Kinmen Islands, as I previously indicated, which is right here. And I can't believe how close we are. I mean, we are just pushing. We're just pushing everybody to want to attack us. So we have the excuse that we need to build more bombs and uh, fuel the military-industrial complex. Speaking of which, 
If I was a betting man and I had no scruples, I would say, you know, weapon stocks, military stocks, Raytheon, Boeing, um, what are the other ones? Northrop Grunman. Uh, companies like that are probably going to do just fine for years to come, but don't quote me on that. That's not financial advice. Unfortunately, uh, we're seeing oil creep up as well, very, very quietly. It's just the two steps forward, one step back. Two steps forward, one step back. Slowly, Brent crude is creeping up, which tells you shit's about to go down in the Middle East. This device here is, I thought this was interesting because everybody's talking about the asymmetrical potential for drones and warfare and how these drones are, are seemingly making modern high intensity warfare impossible for inf infantry, even for just vehicles. Like these drones are just, you know, like a, a few thousand dollar drone is destroying a million dollar piece of military equipment. Now the Russians are having these uh, electronic warfare jammers in their vehicles and the guys are carrying these on their backpacks and this actually uh, you know muddles the the airwaves so that the drone doesn't know where it is it can't communicate with uh, the pilot and so this is this is how they're going to defeat the what is it 1.5 million drones or something like that that Ukraine wants to create so it's a it's a new arms race. Uh, speaking of robotics, now look, I've I've seen videos going back to Petman, the original big dog, back in 2008. I have seen every robot Boston Dynamics adjacent video out there. This one blows my mind. Okay, and I've seen you know Cheetah. I've seen the pet man running and all that stuff, um, the new ones, and, and but this one, this blows my mind. Take a look at this, okay? We're almost here. Now, when they integrate this with NVIDIA's big $30,000, $40,000 chip that they're selling that's like 30 times more powerful than anything else out there, when they integrate that with this, and I'm gonna show you a link next that's gonna show you how they're gonna train these robotics. It's gonna blow your mind. The things we are gonna see in the next five years are gonna be out of a science fiction movie. Take a look at this. I gotta replay that because some of you are gonna be like, some idiot in the comment section was like, Oh yeah, they had that technology in 1990. You could get it at Canadian Tire for 20 bucks. Are you on drugs? Do you know how much computing goes into making something like this and just the mechanics of it? Let's watch that again. That is freaking unbelievable. And this is what they're showing us. That's what they're showing us. And you know how it's learning how to do this? It's not learning how to do this through trial and error. It is learning how to do that in virtual reality. It is running simulations like a virtual dojo millions and millions of times. It's teaching itself how to walk. You can show it something once and it trains itself millions of times in virtual cyberspace and then it converts that into an actual physical movement. Okay, so this is, uh, looks like my freaking camera is going to overheat again. Dang, damn it! All right, so this is what's going down, okay? Now take a look at this. I, I can't really show this because I don't want to get a copyright strike, but this is kind of an example of what they do, okay? So they have these, they have a virtual version of the world. Let me see if I can just quickly show you this here. Uh, let me see here. So... Uh, where's an example? Okay, so they show you the thing happening virtually. I think you guys get what I'm saying. You guys are a smart bunch. You watch this channel after all. Just try, I'll, I'll let it play for a little bit. So they do it virtually, and then the machine is able to uh, materialize that in the real world. Okay, it's able to actually... Uh, reticulate and and uh, put that movement into a real-world application which is just insane 
And then, of course, you integrate large language models. And, I mean, we're about to reach a whole new level of things. And I think this is the only hope the West has to, to fight off the billions, the 7 billion. The only chance that the golden billion has is artificial intelligence and robotics at this point in time. As per Leon Simons, who was here the other day, stopped by the channel to talk about the aerosol masking effect. So this is the global absorbed uh, radiation. This is in the watts per meter. Okay, you can see that we're absorbing a lot more sunlight in 2020. They put in new international maritime regulations that took all the sulfur out of the fuels. That caused a precipitous rise in the warming of the climate. And so this is where we're at. Right here, we're already uh, two degrees above the baseline. They were talking about 1.5 degrees. I think we've already sustained an above two degree above the industrial baseline, which is gonna work itself out in some crazy, wacky weather ways this year. Now, I was gonna talk about this. Let me just shut this off here. Uh, yesterday, I think it's, at first I thought it was kind of silly, but then I guess it made sense. There are states that are warning people to stock up for this solar eclipse. Now, of course, whenever you say something like that, you're going to get all the tinfoil hatters out saying, oh, what are they really preparing for? Is it the end of days? And no, it's not that. They're worried about congestion and traffic. But for me, I mean, just stay home. I mean, you should have enough food in your home for a day. You get out, look outside, watch the eclipse. Don't look at it without the protective safety glasses or whatever it is. And then you go back inside and then you wait for everybody to leave your city. But they're expecting to be millions of people uh, converging on these places. And I don't even know how anybody has money to do this at this point in time. I mean, for me, you know, I don't put any sort of superstitious stock in planetary alignments. I could quite frankly care less. It's like planets are lining up okay. You know, that's meaningful to some people. Maybe some astrology people. Maybe there's some uh, meaning in terms of, uh, anyways, cosmological significance. I, I don't know. But uh, quite frankly, I could care less. I'll watch it, you know, the five minute clip or whatever that gets uploaded to YouTube. I simply do not care. Um, but it's interesting to see so many states warning people to stock up on food. I don't know if I've heard of this in the past. Uh, the last one that happened, I think, was in 2016 or 2017. The next one's not going to be till 2044. But it's interesting to see why these states are get, encouraging people to prepare for a solar eclipse, which is going to be very short-lived. Now, again, I mean, I could go into depth about this, but let's, let's just see. In Texas, they've issued a slew of warnings. People with, living within the path of totality should stock up on groceries and gas and run any errands, including filling prescriptions. Like, they're really expecting gridlock as a result of this, which is crazy. Uh, I just want to see if there's any other stories that I've missed because I know there is one other story before my camera overheats and we get disconnected. It was about Israel. But uh, yeah, Israel and uh, Armenia is uh, getting ready to join NATO, it does look like. Anyways, uh, Israel is loading up their uh, underground parking lots in preparation for a war with Lebanon. Any day now, that war is going to start. So that's what's going on in Texas. Oklahoma is expected to receive an influx of 17 to 66,000 visitors. Apparently that's a lot for them. The state issued warnings for residents to stock up on supplies like groceries, gas, and implement several forms of communication outside cellular phones. I mean, it's a day, people. Still, is this a trial run for something else? Are they priming the population to get ready for some bigger event? Is this a test of sorts? A test of the... How would you say the adaptive capacity of the critical infrastructure? I guess we'll find out. Officials in Ohio have said that traffic delays are inevitable according to News 5 Cleveland. Oh no, a traffic delay. Prepare like it's the end of the world. But don't prepare for World War III because that's never going to happen. There's a guy on uh, X whose name is uh, Normal C. Norman. That guy cracks me up. Up to 1 million people are expected to travel to Indiana to view the eclipse. According to Indianapolis news station, 1 million, that's a lot. And state police are urging residents to prepare for overwhelming traffic. 
keeping cell phones charged. I imagine that the cell networks are going to be potentially clogged too if there's that many people hogging the bandwidth. Stocking up on essentials, filling cars with gas, yada yada yada. Missouri, avoid traffic. New York, stay in place for one day. Another lockdown scenario. They love locking us down. In Kentucky, only a small corner of Western Kentucky will be in the path of totality, but a slew of school districts have decided to close for the eclipse. So they're closing her down. What else do we got? Might as well just keep rocking the mic until we go offline. I think that's about all I wanted to talk about today. That's the gist of it for any of you hardcore diehards who are still here. I can't believe that Lithuania and Germany are not recognizing Vladimir Putin as the leader of the country. Lithuania and Germany have officially declared that they do not recognize the presidential elections as legitimate. Weird. That's how you know nuclear war a cometh. And Washington does want strategic arms control with Moscow and Beijing. According to the UN ambassador, UN Linda to the UN, Linda Thomas Greenfield made a surprising statement. Whenever we say that, though, I always think about the Minsk agreements and how the Russians will never trust anything we say ever again. So, yeah, just keep on prepping. That's why we're getting ready to go off grid, folks. Ukraine is preparing Odessa. Ukrainian armed forces over the last few months, with the assistance of volunteers and regional cadet corps, have significantly expanded their defensive lines near the city of Odessa and between the Odessa and Mykolaiv regions. So Odessa is strategically uh, far more important than other regions of Ukraine, including Kiev, which they'll likely never go for. And Russia next year is going to be uh, unrolling electronic summons to be used for the spring draft. Some people think that this is going to allow them to covertly recruit and draft more people without it garnering public attention. Anyways, guys, if you want to get an emergency survival stash of seeds, go check out CanadianPreparedness.com and uh, just stock up while the getting is good. All these sales right now, we might see a bit of disinflation, but I have a feeling we're going to see stagflation, then parabolic hyperinflation when everybody starts exiting the markets and loading up their bunkers with stuff, which of course at that time will be in limited supply. It's a big game of musical chairs, so you might as well stock up before the music stocks. Thanks for watching, guys. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Canadian Pepper out.